evening, Mr. Chairman, City Council, and Mayor Gratisar. I have a few city updates this evening. Um, well, first, I had to wait for Daryl to turn the recording on, so he said, don't start. <laughs> Um, I do have the COVID numbers, and I do know that uh, Councillor Winner had requested that um, Randy uh, uh, attend and provide updates on a regular basis. And just to share with you that he said he would be willing to join, particularly on um, televised nights, whether it's once a month or whenever you, you know, like him. So he was he was agreeable. Um, but for this evening, uh, the so Colorado Department of Public Health um, website indicates that the one-week cumulative positive case count for Provo County is 221.3, was updated about 4 p.m. this afternoon. It had been over the weekend since last Friday, 218. So it was not a big jump, but a little jump. And the one-week positivity rate of 6.4%. Um, and we have only five days of stabilized hospitalization. So we continue to see increases in, in COVID patients in the hospital. Uh, the health department, though, the, the local PDPHE department on their website reported this morning with an updated vaccination count of at least a one vaccination at 61.3%. So that's into the 60%, but that's just that one vaccination or first dose. And that equals 88,759 citizens who have been vaccinated with at least one dose. I did want to share that the new COVID testing center had opened up just um, this past week outside of the Colorado State Fairgrounds at 2400 West, West Arroyo. I think most of us would know it as the VIP parking uh, space, which would be heading into you know the Arroyo entrance gate right in that parking lot. And it is sponsored by Mako Medical, which is the same vendor that operates the uh, mall site. It is open seven days a week from eight until five. And so that Mako Medical felt that that additional site would be um, available and open uh, to all citizens all day, every day. Uh, just change topics from COVID. Uh, the Mayor's Youth Council is um, co-sponsoring this week with the uh, with League of Women Voters, uh, a city council candidate forum for all candidates that are running from District 3 and 4. It is scheduled for Wednesday, October 6th at 6 p.m. in Memorial Hall. It will be live streamed and recorded and then been, be able to put, be accessible, I believe, through the uh, League of Women Vo uh, Voters site website. What date was that? Wednesday the 6th at 6 p.m. <clears throat> Candidates from District 3 and 4. And District 3 is scheduled from 6 to 7, and then District 4 candidates from 7 to 8. Um, I do have an update from Public Works, um, incident to a request from City Council on um, September 13th in a work session. Um, it was asked the Public Works update um, concerning cooperation on projects related to the Colorado Smelter Revitalization Plan in Bessemer, Eilers, and Grove neighborhoods. And our Public Works Director provides the following update today. And he's here if you have any questions. Uh, the Streets Division has repaired eroded and washed out areas on Santa Fe Avenue between Mesa and Arkansas River Bridge. Public Works has coordinated with private property owners to obtain their buy-in for granting public access easements, supporting the creation of the art walk and um, the installation of creative works along the route. Uh, Public Works is executing a streetscape enhancement project at the intersection of Santa Fe and Mesa. That is right there on the corner where the pizza establishment and restaurant is. Uh, they have coordinated with the Public Conservancy District to focus efforts on building an accessible pathway from Clark Street onto the Arkansas River Levee, which is further down uh, by Mont Carmel Church. And Public Works will be making and installing wayfinding signs along the Art Walk Trail that loops in coordination with the Pueblo County Department of Health and Environment. And uh, Public Works is completing the design work for a sidewalk repair project on Marion Avenue and Egan in the Grove neighborhood. Uh, support for the efforts to improve the Bessemer, Eilers, and Grove neighborhoods are going to continue through within the Public Works Department and through coordination with the BEGIN neighborhood group, B-E-G-I-N. And um, so uh, 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 Director Hayes wanted to make sure and provide that update incident to the mid-September work session uh, when there was the update on the revitalization plan. So a lot of work being done out of Public Works. And the last update that I have is um, for ARPA. Our, um, our presentations this evening, there are six of them, and the mayor will introduce those here in a minute as they come up on the agenda. 
um, but the, um, the funding request period for 2021 expired last Friday on October the 1st, and we received an additional 83 requests um, in the last few days, last week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that total an additional $32,909,000. So there's a lot of work to do from the pillar focus groups uh, to review those recent um, funding requests. Uh, they, they will continue to review those now that there will be no longer funding requests accepted by the city until next year when the, the mayor has a conversation are, are we going to receive the 2022 um, tranche of resources or is something else going to happen with those funds. The internal task force comprised of city staff are going to continue to work on city projects that have been submitted and also on the infrastructure requests before presentation to city council. All of the current uh, requests are on SharePoint. She did an amazing job today to get all of the additional 83 requests loaded on the SharePoint and divided by pillar for, so they can get to work. Um, this evening, there are six additional ones for a second <coughs> wave for your consideration. And uh, that does conclude the updates from the city this evening. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Solano. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, Councilor Solange. Macaulay Bachicha. Did you forget me already? <laughs> I just okay. um, I just want to thank Andrew for all your work um, with the Bessemer a Revitalization Group. I think it's uh, the Grove Eilers area. I know they truly appreciate it. I've gotten plenty of calls, and um, you went above and beyond in that meeting with them. Andrew stood till about seven o'clock, hearing all their concerns. It was about a three-hour meeting, and went out and looked at the roads with them and everything. So, thank you, Andrew, and your group. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Okay, we'll move on. Number two on the agenda is the non-departmental budget request. Uh, Mayor Gratizar and Ms. Lano. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, uh, tonight we begin our discussion of the uh, 2022 proposed budget for the city of Pueblo. It's my understanding that you've all previously been provided with the non-departmental budget requests that uh, we got from all the agencies. I haven't counted them up, but probably 20, 25 agencies there. Uh, Daryl, if you'll load that uh, PowerPoint, we'll go through that a little bit. Um, and these are ones that you have seen before. Um, there might only be one new one, and that might be the one that you heard a presentation on with respect to the uh, Homa Heroes. I think there's an allocation in here to help them with that uh, project that they were going to work on. So let's uh, just sort of start here. And this gives you an idea of how they're broken down and the areas. This slide that's on the screen right now, I think you probably also have a, a, uh, a copy of the PowerPoint uh, in, your, in your packet. But this shows you how these um, have broken down. And really the ones that, uh, where we have the most amount of discretion is that last one there, the contributions. Um, the others are um, sort of fixed in a lot of respects. There's probably some room to wiggle on some of them, but uh, uh, you'll see that uh, um, we've added $100,000 in the mayor's contingency to this non-departmental um, And uh, we've got a council contingency as well that'll show up on another page. But the total of these requests, or this is what we've proposed to you, is $6,723,571. That's what we've recommended. And what was requested was um, $7,202,466. We can go through those in a lot of detail. I know that you've been provided with them. The next slide shows you the chart in terms of the previous page, sort of the a pie chart that gives you the idea that the part where we, as I say, we really have the discretion is in the contributions at $1.291 million there. Um, the contractual ones, the 4, 4 million, 4.1 million, um, those are, you know, the animal shelter, uh, Chamber of Commerce, some of those kind of organizations that um, 
um, are sort of set in stone, especially with respect to the uh, the animal shelter, where we have actually a written contract with them that says this is how much we'll pay them um, for that year. So that's really where the discretion's at in the contributions. Um, these are the non-departmental operational the CML dues or 62,000. We're proposing that. That's what, what they're gonna be for this year. We've been advised council contingencies that remains the same as last year. And as I say, we've added the mayor contingencies to this account as well in the same amount. That's the same as last year. Latino chamber dues, $11,000. The National League of Cities, that's a new expenditure, $9,440. Uh, I believe that this is an organization that we should, we joined this year, that we should continue our membership in that. We have gained a lot of uh, access to um, seminars, webinars, um, and, and programs with respect to that. And we've also had an opportunity to make presentations to other cities in the National League of Cities. So I think the interaction, albeit at this point virtually with the other representatives from other cities around the country is beneficial to us. We learn a lot from them and hopefully they can learn a little bit from us as well. Um, PACOG, the dues there are fixed by the PACOG board. Um, and those dues remain the same as they were uh, previously, $55,007. Any questions about any of those non-departmental or any anybody want to talk about those at all? Shouldn't we just get to the end of this? And then, yeah. Are you oh, done with the whole well, presentation? No, 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 let's go to the next slide. So these are the uh, contractual and quasi-contractual. Um, these are the recommendations there that what I'm recommending to you is for 2022. The Aircraft Museum, um, we're recommending funding them at the amount of $10,000. The Chamber of Commerce recommending funding them at $800,000. Um, they were at 750,000 last year. They asked for 950 this year. My recommendation is uh, 800,000. Park maintenance, um, we're recommending that they be funded at the same level as they were in 2021. Uh, Human Relations Commission, uh, a few, couple of thousand dollars more um, to the extent of $13,638. The Nature Wildlife and Discovery Center, we've increased their allocation to $285,150. The Pikes Peak Humane Society, as I say, this is pursuant to a written contract. And that's the contractual amount that we're obligated to pay uh, in 2022 is $1,420,768,000. So there's no flexibility there at this point. Um, Pueblo Zoo Capital Account, we're recommending uh, no additional funding there or no funding for this year. Last year, I think they requested $60,000 and they had historically requested $60,000, but they haven't spent it. So we're not including that this year. Pueblo Zoo Operations, we are uh, increasing significantly what uh, we're contributing to them, uh, owing mostly to the fact that uh, in many respects, like the city, they're having a hard time attracting people and keeping people to work for them. So most of their requests are to try to bring their employees up to um, a level that's semi-competitive with other communities and with uh, our community so that they're able to uh, to operate. So that's a pretty significant bump for them, but in reviewing their proposal, talking with their board and with their director, I think it's justified. SRDA, the Senior Recreation Center Program, Senior Program, we're funding that as the same level, recommending that it be funded at the same level as, um, as last year. Uh, the State Fair, we're um, restoring their funding basically to $250,000. Um, which is uh, what it had previously been last year, owing to the pandemic and our uncertainty about where we would end up. We cut their funding like we did many of these other organizations and asked them to sort of um, 
be cautious with us and live on less money. Last year, while we tried to wade through this pandemic, but uh, we're, we feel comfortable now that we can restore the state fairs funding to $250,000. YMCA, you'll see in the non-departmental contractual and quasi-contractual, there's no money for the YMCA because our contract and our obligation to pay them $200,000 a year has expired. But you'll see when we get to the next page, maybe it's, was it the previous page? Okay, you'll see we put the YMCA in another area and we're recommending that they still be paid the 250,000, uh, the 200,000, I'm sorry. Uh, this is what we recommend be uh, paid to the, the health department uh, out of the general fund revenues, um, the environmental cleanup, 100,000. And what they requested was the 719, 483. <clears throat> They've also made an ARPA request for some additional funding from the health department for some premium pay that we're continuing to evaluate. But I wanted you to be aware of that. And we'll have a conversation about um, some of these other programs as well, making requests for ARPA funds as well as making requests for CSAC funds. So we're trying to coordinate as best we can, but at least six of the organizations that are listed here in the non-departmental have also made requests for uh, CSAC funds. So as we decide how we wanna handle them, uh, we will um, certainly communicate with the CSAC review committee and with the ARPA committee with respect to the funding we're gonna get. So it might be that they're requesting funding for totally different projects from each of the entities and organizations, in which case I think that it might be acceptable to, for them to get awards from each of those entities, but we certainly do not wanna duplicate um, any programs. So we don't wanna give them double funding for the same program. So we have some things to work through there and, and we'll continue to do that. But with respect to the health department, as you know, this is the city county health department. The, the county also contributes a large sum to, to them as well. But our recommended total appropriation to the health department for 2022 is $819,483. And these are the uh, contributions basically um, that uh, we're recommending. The abatement assistance is $25,000. That's the program that uh, um, assists individuals who get a code violation from the city. If they can't clean up their property, we, we use that fund to help them clean up their property. Uh, the Arts Alliance has not uh, received funding in the past. Uh, they've requested funding this year and I'm recommending that uh, we give them $20,000 worth of funding. Uh, the Bessemer Historical Society, we're recommending $42,000. That's up from what uh, uh, they got in 2021. Uh, Again, that restores them to where they were in 2020 before we cut them um, because of COVID. Uh, Boys and Girls Club, we're recommending $20,000 for them in the... Uh, Um, which restores them to the level they had in 2020. Um, Karen Share didn't request funds, I think, this year. Um, Downtown Association, we're asked, they've asked for some additional funds so they can make some additional improvements. And we're recommending $30,000 for the Downtown Association. Fountain Watershed District, those are essentially our dues. Um, to the district. So you'll see that's increased pretty significantly over 2021. And the Home of Heroes, this is the one I was talking about earlier, where um, you saw the presentation that uh, they asked for our assistance so they can upgrade the display in the, the remodel convention center to make it more interactive and make it more robust. We're recommending $75,000 there. I think that was the general sense of, of the council. Uh, Juneteenth, restoring them to what they had historically uh, gotten. Uh, La Gente, we're recommending 20,000, which is what they've historically gotten. Latino Chamber, 25,000. They didn't take a cut last year. Uh, they asked for 25 this year, and we're recommending that as well. Um, NAACP, we're increasing that amount to 3,000. 
Um, the CSAC payments to Pueblo County, we're recommending that that remain at $490,000. Um, we're starting to get reports now from uh, the CSAC uh, for their recommendations. I think they've gotten a total of $1.7 million in requests from CSAC, and they'll be prepared to make recommendations uh, pretty quickly, I think. Obviously, they've got less than a million dollars uh, that they have to uh, distribute. Uh, Paco, um, we're recommending $7,000 there for that organization. Pueblo Heritage Museum is one that has not received funds in the past that we're recommending that we fund them to the tune of $15,000. This is one of the organizations I think that uh, has um, requested uh, money from CSAC as well. In fact, they made a $10,000 request from, from CSAC for the Pueblo Heritage Museum. So this is organization was obviously devastated by COVID to a large extent because uh, they were closed down for, for much of the time and uh, they're still trying to recover. So um, we have uh, put them in there for that. The Pueblo Symphony, they didn't request any funding this year. We've helped them in the past and I think uh, maybe the council has helped them directly. Uh, correct? Sure. Um, I was going to ask that, uh, well, that 7,500 didn't go to the symphony. It went to the uh, um, uh, convention center, basically, for rent of the Memorial Hall for the 4th of July. So they, the symphony never really got that money. Uh, that was just for the rent of the Memorial Hall. But I was going to ask that we add $20,000 for the symphony. They are in a heck of a pickle this year. Uh, they did ask for ARPA funds, but um, that even that's not going to be enough. Hopefully, uh, okay. they'll be able to stay awake, stay awake, stay afloat uh, this year. But I was going to ask that we add them to the uh, non-departmental contributions okay. to, to the tune of twenty thousand because uh, they certainly deserve it. They do a lot of uh, uh, school type things. Uh, they bring in. Uh, kids to they do a, a full two days I think of uh, symphony for the school kids in in town and not to mention all the what it does. Uh, they had a concert a week and a half ago two weeks ago something like that 78 people showed up and that's not going to pay for a, a symphony so I, I I really would hate to see them shut down they're, they're 93 years old we're one of the only symphonies in the cities in the country that have have symphonies not that many do so okay why don't we get through this and then we'll have that conversation okay. about it okay um so the symphony there purple Pueblo triple aim they weren't funded last year but we're recommending funding to the tune of one hundred and twenty two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars this is the organization that sort of coordinates the activity of the um the homeless uh, commission the homeless and housing commission and works with them in, in that regard um the art center we're recommending uh, funding um at the level of three hundred thousand dollars this is up from what they actually got in 2020 a hundred thousand dollars more than they got last year during covid when they were closed much of the time but next this next year is going to be an important year for the art center it's their 50th anniversary they um are planning to bring a an exhibit here the machines of leonardo da vinci which is apparently exclusive to colorado uh that'll be at the art center here it's an expensive um show to bring in and i know that they were wanting us to chip in something extra for that but what i've indicated to them is that this funding level three hundred thousand, that the city's basically all in for uh, the uh, Da Vinci thing, and that I don't think there'd be any further money available. Now, that's certainly subject to uh, discussions with council, but that's what I've communicated to uh, to the Art Center, that we'll increase their funding, but that will be for the extent of our obligation next year to the Art Center. Uh, save and accept the tickets we buy for, you know, some of their events and galas and those kind of things, but in terms of writing checks for things. Sister City Commission, uh, $5,000, that's what they've historically gotten. The Trash Task Force, nothing was requested this year, that's absorbed into 
the uh, funding at the uh, health department. That program is housed in the health department now, and they operate it out of the health department. So that's where the funding for that comes from. Um, YMCA, there's that $200,000. That's the first time it appears on this page. Previously, it appeared in the contractual page. Um, we're not contractually obligated to pay it, but like many of the other organizations and institutions, they were really adversely affected by COVID and have requested our assistance and have requested that we maintain and continue that $200,000 payment uh, to them. Um, and the YWCA has uh, requested $50,000. So the total there of these non-departmental contributions is $1.491 million. These are the ones where we really have the discretion over. They're not, we're not contractually bound by any of this, uh, save and except maybe the Fountain Creek Watershed District. Um, but uh, the rest I think are sort of uh, open for discussion. Um, I think that concludes uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I want to preface all this by saying that these recommendations from me are all premised upon the fact that 2A is going to pass. And if 2A doesn't pass, that you'll see, I think, some perhaps different recommendations from, from us as we uh, try to figure out how we'll deal with that situation. So. Um, I just want to make sure that that's at the um, top of your mind as we consider not only these these requests, but also as we consider the budget that's going to be presented to you um, pretty shortly. It's we're, we're working on it. We're trying to get it finalized in a draft that can be uh, shared with you. But it is likewise premised upon the fact that we believe 2A will pass and we don't have anything budgeted for refunding any excess funds um, that were collected in 2020 or 2021, but that will have to change if, if uh, 2A does not pass. So we'll have to take a much, much harder look at, uh, uh, at, at that at that time. But we're uh, happy to take any questions. Between Laura and I, we hope we can answer questions. As I say, I, it's my understanding that you all received copies of the requests that were made for these, uh, um, for these funds. So questions, comments, Councilor Schilling? A couple, <clears throat> Hart wanted uh, 437, you're giving them 70,000 less. What aren't they gonna be able to do? Let me uh, pull that up and... Were they looking to do some major capital thing? Or are they gonna cut the grass left off? Hart. Well, wait a minute. You Maybe I'm reading that wrong. You're giving yeah. them 437. Yeah. Okay. Pardon me? You're yeah. giving them 437, correct? No. That was a request. Okay. Their request You're offering 360. Was, uh, so I guess my question is still relevant. Yeah. I think uh, part of my thinking was there that we, we contributed $1.2 million to HARP this year by acquiring that Ferguson property. And it wasn't directly to HARP, but it's to further their interests. Um, I'm trying to see what amount. Uh... Okay. They have the I same. I didn't mean problems. this to be so long. They have so many. They have the same problems that everybody else has. I mean, uh, wages are going up. Okay. Hard to get people. Okay. Uh, and there's many things on their capital improvement plan that need to be taken care of. Okay, I'm, I'm good with I that. I guess what's concerning is that every organization here gets a, a bump in the money that they requested for uh, over 2021. And the crown jewel of the city could arguably be the uh, harp. And we're just going to leave them alone and say, you just do with what you got. Well, a concern I have, the new ones that you put on here, they're going to think they belong on there forever and they might might be a bad surprise down the road. With the Discovery Center, is that the Nature Center? Yes. Okay. And Stephen and Andrew are going to go take a look at the Mountain Park. Is that different than the Discovery Center? Okay. Is that different than what? Well, well, they're we, both the same. Okay. that's. I want to make sure I was correct. Yeah. yeah. So they were going to go up and take a look at that. Are we going to hear 
there was complaints about the shape it was in. Are we going to, at some point in time, hear what they figure we're going to need? I see Andrew nodding his head back there. Is that correct? Stephen, somebody answer me. The needs? Okay, thank you. Um, last question. Why is the Fountain Creek watershed almost a 50% increase? What are we getting for 50% more? Well, I'll they just need it. It's oh. Fountain, uh, Fountain Creek watershed, uh, 36,000. Last year they got 23,000. I think that's the amount they requested, 37,758. Yeah, well, yeah, 36.58 up from 23.986. Yeah, as you know, they've been working on projects down here now. They're not using their own money, but they're in the process of uh, planning, I think, for how to sustain this organization in terms of uh, um, setting up a district that will be able to levy taxes. Right now, they sustain themselves from $50 million, I think, that Colorado Springs paid in a settlement and through these contributions or dues, if you will, that the respective communities chip in. So I think they're doing good work in Pueblo. I think this is an essential thing that we've got to support. Actually, they spent in the last two, three, two years, they spent $18 million on uh, the Fountain Creek. In, in Pueblo, yes. Uh, the uh, Highway 47 project, the 13th Street project, and then the dredging of the uh, creek from uh, I just wonder Street if everybody down to got a raise or something like that. Okay. No. Uh, I think what they're doing is they're uh, – Bill Banks is the only person. He is the administration. Uh, what he's doing is that he's getting a uh, administrative assistant, okay. and he's also getting some, uh, some other help in, in the office. Yeah, because he's – inundated with everything i mean he has to he has to do everything uh, the settlement that was made with colorado springs uh it was quite a chunk of money uh none of that can be used for operations no or, no no and uh, the only operational money they get is from the participating uh entities which fountain. Is fountain pueblo if, if you all, all, yeah. all the cities within the district and they didn't really make a request they attached gave us just two pages but the second page shows where they're getting their funding from and you know public county is going to kick in uh, 21,320 we're recommending 36,757 El Paso County unincorporated El Paso County is going to pay 69,895 and the city of Colorado Springs is going to fund them to the tune of $164,908.06. So their whole budget is 306000 So we're, you know, paying about 10% of that. And I think we're getting a pretty good deal out of it. Thank you. Anybody else down here? Uh, Larry, do you want to yeah, talk uh, about Yeah, let's uh, talk about the symphony again. That $7,500, uh, Mark and I, hopefully in January, are going to broker a, a, a deal so that the symphony will be able to play at, on the 4th of July in the uh, Riverwalk area rather than the uh, the Memorial Hall. So that is, that'll save us $7,500 right there. But like I said, the symphony is in a heck of a pickle right now. And uh, if, if you guys would... Uh, agree to it, we could add them to our non-departmental contributions to the tune of 20,000. Well, and as I understand it, uh, apparently uh, Dr. Chi, who's the director of the symphony, no longer, is, he's retired from CSUP, correct? Yeah. And apparently they sort of subsidize his salary for the symphony, for the symphony while he was performing those services. Yeah. And that'll no longer be the case. So I think one of the expenses they're looking for funding for is to be able to continue to compensate Dr. Dr. Chi, Chi for yeah. his uh, services as the director of the true symphony. True. So. Right, Councilor Schilling. And Larry, I hate to disagree with you, but <clears throat> I did enjoy the symphony music uh, over the 4th of July, but 20,000 bucks is more money than we've ever given him. 
and if you have a, a product that only draws 70 people, how long do we want to support that? I don't know that that makes a lot of sense to me. 20,000 to me is a big number. And maybe another number is different, but again, if you only, if people aren't interested in your product, your car, your well, candy. Well, well it should be said it's because of COVID that yeah. they didn't get anybody to go to the, to the concert. Otherwise, uh, they practically fill Ho Hall of the university for every single one of their concerts. Uh, their Christmas concert is sold out most of the time. Uh, it's And then the others depend. Uh, if it's classical symphonic music, you get a few less people, but uh, if you get a, a Broadway show type uh, music, you'll get a lot of people. Too. Now they have a pretty good uh, following. It's just that uh, they had a fundraiser at the country club that kind of fizzled too. So uh, it's an older audience that goes for the most part. Uh, you're not gonna find a lot of teenagers and young people there. But uh, well, I for they're, one, they're really well attended, except for this last concert. I for one think that's a ton of money, but that's only me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I do understand your love for the arts, and that was your life. So yeah. I understand that. <clears throat> Thanks. Councilor Flores? Uh, I just wanted to uh, support Larry, because I, I, I hate to see the symphony uh, after 93 years. I mean, it would be, I think it would be... Uh, an injustice for us to, not to help them at this point. And by the way, they do it. They do have a lot of young people in the symphony itself. And so what, what a great experience for them uh, to have that opportunity. Is there a sense that we should put some money in for the symphony? symphony? How, how does everybody feel about that? Yeah. Okay. Flores. I, I thought I heard you sir, say that Karen Share was not in here. I mean, I didn't see them on this list, but unless I missed it, they're not. I don't think they are. Because they didn't request. But didn't we have some sort of a contractual arrangement with them to help pay for uh, the, the manager of the Sunnyside market? I think that was just for one year to get just them started, yeah. And yeah. that was that was the agreement that was I, it actually said that in the contract because I haven't looked at the contract recently. But. Yeah, uh, Karen share uh, show, it appears on the very last page. Oh. You can see it here. Oh. It is on the one, two, three, four, fifth one down, and you can see where they requested by contract to forty thousand dollars. That was a startup uh, for that Sunnyside market, and it was paid in full um, uh, in in twenty twenty year. Um, and they did not submit a request um, for the city in non-departmental, but they did submit a CSAC request. And I believe the CSAC request is in the amount of 97,000. And of course that hasn't been a, a, a reviewed or, or awarded yet, but it is on the CSAC list. 95,000 they requested from CSAC, yes. Thank you. Uh, one, one last clarification here. I noticed that the columns and the headings are different. Like, like on everything else, it says actual request and authorized. On this one, it just says proposed, estimated, actual, actual. So how do we know they didn't request it? All of the requests are in your notebooks and it would okay. appear on the, 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 the long spreadsheet that sits at the very beginning of the presentation. And you all received this electronically about three weeks ago. No, we uh, and, then, and, and then all this uh, coincides with what was included in the non-departmental notebook for all of the details. So it just did not come in as a request. I, I don't know what the situation is, uh, but you know they we did this for the first time last year, and it 2020. was at 2020. And uh, I'm just wondering whether they know knew, I guess, how the process worked. But they all um, received letters um, um, requesting a submission of a of a of a request from City Council. Uh, Tracy's responsible. She sent out all of the letters in um, early spring, um, requesting their information back by July, and she sends those based on the funding from um, the last year. Oh, no. 
no, but you know, we're going to have this conversation and we'll go back and revise the budget that we recommend to you. And that's where these will be included is in the, that final budget document. Obviously, um, we want you to review that and that's subject to change. I mean, if council decides that they want to change something that we've recommended in that budget, uh, if you got four votes, change it. Yeah. Uh, were you, Mark, were you requesting an increase for the HARP maintenance? Well, because they got the same as last year. And I, I understand that everything is costing a lot more today and uh, they definitely, the HARP definitely could use more maintenance. Yeah, you know, I mean, I would support uh, an increase there. Okay. I, I don't know how, you know, we might talk to them and say, what, what are your needs? Well, their needs are four hundred and thirty-seven yeah. thousand well, dollars. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know if I go up that. Yeah, high. what what we did is gave them the same thing we gave them in in twenty twenty. Now, um, that's you know it's a large sum of money. Um, yeah, but like Mark says, it's it's. I mean, it's the the crown jewel of Pueblo. I mean, uh, I I bumped into a, a couple from. Uh, Southern California one day on the river walk and they, they were amazed how beautiful and wonderful it was. And uh, we just got to keep it that way. Well, I, I agree. It's the count crown jewel. Yeah. That's why we spent this year $1.2 million to well, acquire the Ferguson property. That's true. So I think we've really done a lot for Harp uh, so far, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go back and take a look at it. I'll go back and review their request and see if uh, um, we'll take another look at it. And, uh, is that fair? You know, this is a this is a very difficult process early on like this. Uh, you know, and it's always a hard process for me. And uh, as a matter of fact, my Apple Watch said my heart rate was dangerously high through several conversations that we've had. But I've got I've calmed down and and and, and things are all right. Uh, so do you want to throw out a number for heart? No, I'm just talking about this overall. Oh. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's so many questions that, that are on the table. Uh, you're talking about 2A. Uh, we got that doesn't happen until November 2nd. We don't have uh, uh, we don't ha have a budget in front of us to see how how uh, based on our, our numbers, you know, where are we at? How do you how do we ascertain where we should be on non-departmental expenses if we don't know how it fits into the big picture of the total budget. And so in my opinion, many times we do this every year and we kind of put the uh, cart before the horse when we're not seeing the bigger numbers. The, the, the big question is, is why should it make any difference whether 2A passes or not based upon looking how, if it was just a normal year, where you had a, and by no means has this been a normal year, where you had a 30% increase in sales tax. Even if 2A doesn't pass and you have to refund a portion of that, okay, there's still a bump out of that 30% that the city retains. So based off of the 2021 numbers, you're still gonna have a bump in 2022 for sure, because we're at a 30% increase in taxes as of the last report. We don't know where it's gonna end up. So does it really have that big of an effect on how these, not, the, these, these numbers go and being able to give us uh, uh, proposals on a budget to be able to understand and know how this all fits together, whether 2A passes or not. Well, if 2A doesn't pass, we have to refund from 2020, $536,000. Correct. For 2020. For 2021, obviously we don't know that number yet, but it could be 10 million bucks that we have to refund. Yeah, but we could potentially be up 30 million. So it, No, we won't be up 30 million. If, if well, well, if you had a 30% bump in sales tax, how much would that be? That would be uh, 30 million. That would be um, every ten percent is uh, five million dollars. Five fifteen million. million. Fifteen million. Right. So if you gave back ten and you uh, had to pay five hundred, that'd be ten point ten point five out of fifteen million. You'd still have a bump of four million dollars. So, so we ought to be able to see. 
just trying to ask for them. We shouldn't be trying to budget based upon whether 2A passes. We should be budgeting our expenses and because quite frankly, 2A is not going to have anything to do with the structural deficit within our budget. It doesn't, it doesn't erase expenses. Right. You still have those expenses. So that bump doesn't make a big difference on, on, on these numbers per se, because you, quite frankly, you're not spending the money on these anyway, if 2A passes. We'll have the money for those already in the budget. It's already in the budget. It's the money from 2A is supposed to go to roads and infrastructure. So what difference does it make if 2A passes? Why can't we see the budget based upon what it should, what it would be without 2A? Well, because without 2A, we have to plan on refunding money. That okay. Should that be in the budget? Yes. I think in your preliminary numbers, it should be in the budget to say, here's where our sales tax is. Every year we get it saying, this is the projected numbers. So if you're gonna, pre if, if the finance director is going to uh, project a 30% increase or a 25% increase in sales tax is, is happening this year, but you're only going to project how much for next year. You know, how, how is it that we're going to, going to look at these numbers? Yeah. All I'm saying is it's impossible to try and, and, and make these make sense without those kind of numbers to look. Well, at. we have to start somewhere. And so I understand. We, yeah. I so understand. we want to have this discussion about these particular things, uh, you know, and you'll see the entire budget in the next couple of weeks or Mr. Chairman, um, for clarification, the the budget book for non-departmentals were sent out for, for your reference and information and for all of you ahead of time with a request um, to uh, have tonight's discussion along with the budget discussion and at your direction, it was asked to be moved early on. And so that's why the presentation this evening only addresses the non-departmental requests. Um, and so we, we did put this, this together just for starting of a discussion of the budget um, someplace. And this particular part was ready to go for tonight. Uh, the, uh, the budget must be submitted um, to city council on, on Tuesday, October 12th, which is next Tuesday. And there is a work session that's devoted only to the 2022 budget submission. And uh, by charter, the, the mayor must formally submit to city council. Three days after that, the city clerk must um, release to the general public that there will be a public hearing uh, two weeks after that, uh, which is October 25th. And that the budgets can still be changed, but there's opportunity then for the general public to speak to the budget. And then it must be on first reading on, I think, November the 8th and passed November the 22nd. By charter, it's required to be passed by the 1st of December. And all of that is a lesson from our city attorney and the mayor. So I did pretty good relaying those dates. Very good report. Short and concise. I like that. Uh, Councilor Schilling. Um, I think what I heard from the mayor was we are going to get another regular budget if we don't pass 2A. That's what you said, correct? So you're really going to provide two budgets. What, I'm, what, I, what I think we're here for tonight, we're trying to create this funnel and we're trying to get down through the funnel and figure out what actually comes out of the bottom. So I like having this information. I think it's useful. And I mean, no, we can't make any permanent decisions because we don't know absolutes, but at least we got some idea of what's going on. And I really do think it's like a funnel we, or a sieve or whatever you want to call it. We got to funnel all these things down before we come up with the, the idea. Everybody good to move on? We'll move on to number three on the agenda, which is an ARPA project, the ADA playground. Ms. Madrid? Mr. Mayor, that's the mayor. That is this slide, the slide presentation to introduce the six that are here this evening for the total funding. Do I have that? Oh, do you uh, want to do that first? Yeah, the mayor will do that, yes. You can still have a Where's seat, Ms. At? Madrid. We'll have it's a little right presentation from the mayor top. first, and then uh, we'll get to you. <laughs> Mayor. Yes, this is uh, 
these are the six projects that we're bringing forward tonight. These have come through the uh, uh, the pillars review process. The total funding recommendation tonight is one million twenty two thousand two hundred seventy dollars. Um, we're asking um, with respect to the first presentation, the ADA playground, we want to have this presented to you. We're not convinced in our own minds yet that this is uh, ARPA um, qualified. So we're, we're still trying to work through that a little bit. It's not in a qualified census tract, which would make it sort of a no brainer. As you know, the, um, um, the final rules and regulations haven't come out yet. So uh, we're, we're gonna, I want you to hear about this, uh, what's going on there, but we're, we're withholding making a decision on this at the present time, simply because we need to get additional information. But all uh, six of these have been uh, vetted. We wanted you to hear about it. Um, after discussions with council, we'll make a determination with respect to bringing these forward to you. We talked about doing it on an emergency basis, but probably we'll just bring it the ones that have to come on an ordinance because there's a contract that has to be entered into, we'll probably do that in the ordinary course. So you have plenty of time to do it. The ones that by resolution, we might bring them to you as early as next week, but, uh, and I'm not sure any of these can come by resolution, um, but um, we're, we're gonna continue to move through this process. As you heard Ms. Solano say, we got a boatload of uh, proposals right before the deadline. And I haven't looked at all of them. I sort of skimmed some of them and some of them I think are unique and will be uh, uh, worthwhile, but there's a lot of work that the citizens committee has to do, that the mayor's office has to do, that you have to do to go through these uh, proposals and determine which ones will move us forward as a community um, in the best possible fashion. So, but we're gonna start this tonight. You, we went through this process before. I guess one question we'd like some direction at, at the end of this meeting is, you want us to put these before you one at a time or put them up uh, all at once? So maybe we'll have some idea when you get through with uh, the review today. So, yeah, Laura? Uh, may I add one um, piece um, of information? Um, Thank you to our ARPA coordinator. You all have a hard copy of the six um, support requests that have been submitted through SharePoint. If you'd like an electronic copy, we can send them electronically. And if you'd like to have access to the SharePoint, you already you do already do have access, but they're all located there as well. Thank you. That's a great report. Ms. Madrid. Can you, can you turn your mic on? Just hit that button right there. There you go. And she's accompanied tonight by uh, Keith Frazier, an old friend of mine. Keith, yes, good to see you. Good evening, members of City Council, Mayor Gratishire, City Government staff, and fellow ARPA presenters. Thank you for inviting me to present our playground proposal that would benefit so many of our citizens, particularly after what we have endured through this pandemic. With the impact of COVID, cities across our nations are seeing an increase in mental health issues. One affordable activity that is found to address our emotional needs is the opportunity to spend more time outdoors and physical activities. Spending time outdoors reduces your symptoms of anxiety and depression. An analyst of 10 studies found that spending time in a green environment improves the mood and self-esteem. Those struggling with mental illness saw significant increase in the self-esteem and saw a reduction in their depression symptoms. Furthermore, the, the Mental Health Foundation says to look after your mental health using exercise. Their publication states that there are many reasons why physical activity is good for your body. But did you know that physical activity is also beneficial for the mental health and well-being? The publication states that there are four categories of physical activity, daily physical activity, exercise, sports, and play, which is defined as unstructured activity that is done for fun or enjoyment. This playground would provide this type of physical activity for our citizens. This playground would provide a reason to enjoy the outdoors. Our belief is that everyone deserves the opportunity to play or relive play. 
create access, keep it simple, make it affordable, promote choice, add sensory elements, and provide opportunities for all. This proposal would create Pueblo's first public outdoor all-inclusive ADA accessible playground at Laura's Park, an inclusive design to create physical space and activities to ensure everyone feels included and can play to the greatest extent possible. An inclusive playground eliminates barriers and encourages personal growth. Every child has the right to play, but not every child has the opportunity to do so in our local parks or schools, nor do playgrounds offer or provide access for those with diverse developmental needs in our community, such as wheelchair accessible, sensory activities and large and small motor skills. Because our two only existing ADA all-inclusive playgrounds are located at Bessemer Academy and Cedar Ridge Elementary School in Pueblo West, their abilities during school hours is not an option for toddlers or senior citizens. There are three assisted living facilities within a block of this park. For people identified with dementia and cognitive decline, physical activity can help to delay further decline in functioning, not to mention the value of the vitamin D from a sunshiny day. Studies show that there is approximately a 20 to 30 percent lower risk of depression and dementia from adults participating in de daily physical activity. Physical activity also seems to reduce the likelihood of experiencing cognitive decline in people who do not have dementia. Ultimately, our design will create an environment to accommodate individuals' abilities, yet provide an atmosphere where all children and adults can be themselves and join in the total enjoyment experience throughout the playground, which provides a support activity for mental health of our fellow Puebloans. If approved, we are excited about the possibilities and we will work hard to make sure that the playground is well known to our assisted living facilities, Soaring Eagles Autism Center and school-based exceptional student service sites. Mr. Frazier, whose home is adjacent to the park, myself and my granddaughter have applied for adopting the park to help maintain its attractiveness for used by our community. I have prepared a sample of showing a preliminary sketch of the playground map, as well as a picture of the proposed playground. You will see the green ramps, ramps provide for toddlers, crawling, folks with walkers, and even wheelchairs, as well as sensory activities for all on each of the orange decks. We appreciate your time and look forward to securing funds to make this playground a reality that is accessible and is designed for so many individuals ranging from toddlers to seniors, emphasizing physical activity and emotional health. Providing a public area that is outdoors, accessible, affordable, and emphasize play in a very unique playground to address our mental wellness would be a gift to our community as we continue to navigate the ongoing mental health issues intensified by COVID over the last year and a half. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Questions, comments? Everybody's good? Sir, you want to say anything? Yes. Sir. Get that, get your button there on that thing. Thank you, Okay, it turned red. We'll give this a shot. First of all, thank you all for, for letting me come and speak. Your speech was fantastic because I support everything that she said in there so much because my life has been devoted to, to sports and athletics and how important that is. I taught in the district for 29 years, elementary PE, coach, coached volleyball at the high school, coached gymnastics in the high school and at the college. So my whole world has been tied into, I love seeing this because this is for not just the athletic kids, but it's for all kids, the kids that are in wheelchairs. It's well put together. I'm gonna come at a, a kind of a different angle than where you'd think I would be in the elementary PE teacher is that I come from, I was the first house in that whole area and that was a weeds. There was no grass there to start with right next to me where this park is at right now. 
So I've watched the city struggle in trying to do what they could. And I, I hope you can find it in this budget or whatever budget that you can find, but it has gone from weeds out there for years. And then finally we got in grass and I was so thrilled with the grass that I used to take my own lawnmower out there and mow out rectangles for the kids to be able to roll a soccer ball because the grass was so high because I know the city was struggling at times. So I was the crazy guy that the recreation department come and said, you know, you can't take your own lawnmower out there, but I did. I, I love this park. And then to see it finally get some playground equipment in it, but little by little, you can see the playground equipment deteriorate over the years. And then when this terrible tragedy happened, this little girl used to play in that park. She grew up just down the street from me. Uh, she was on the swim team with my niece at South High School. She's been the student that grew up in that park, went to the elementaries, went to the middle schools and the high schools there, participated. And then to find out that she became a FBI agent, I was so proud. And then to find out that she was doing something for our nation, just like our military has done, she was doing something fantastic for our nation and she got killed and she's a mother and she just needs to be represented better than, I love what you guys have done already. There's a nice little bench out there and we've got a rock that has her name on it, Laura's Park, and that's fantastic. But truly, I think we need to do something more. Whatever you can do, whatever you can find in your budgets, I know it's hard, but when somebody has given their life for our country and grew up in that park, I'm hoping that we can do more than put a rose bush out. That's, it's, it's just not acceptable. So I, I love everything that you said in there, but I'm kind of coming from, I've, I've grown up with that park. I helped put the rose bushes in that park. I've helped the whole works. So I would love to see it blossom into whatever the next stage is that you can help us with it. So please find in your hearts and think about this little girl that got killed as an FBI agent serving her country. Well, we it. can do something for her. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, Councilor Flores. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, what a great report, uh, Mrs. Madrid. And uh, thank you for the history lesson, too. I grew up on uh, Starlight, too, Grove, where I lived there for part of my life. But this was your, I wanted to ask you a question. This was one of your original dreams when you wanted to name the park, was putting an ADA accessible park there. And I, I did a little bit of research myself, too, and I was surprised that we really have only had one, uh, which is at Bessemer School within the city limits. And uh, that just happened like uh, two years ago. So I, I mean, this to me is uh, a necessity for uh, the kids that are handicapped and obviously uh, other individuals with handicaps can utilize it. But I just, I just think that this is a, um, uh, long overdue, irregardless of whether or not we had uh, this situation with this heroine uh, that that gave her life, you know, to uh, to our country, really. And uh, so, I just wanted to reconfirm that was part of your dream when you when we changed the name of the park was to put an ADA uh, park in that area or a playground. Laura wanted uh, to help all children. And so we wanna make sure that we include all children to be able to play at this park and enjoy it just as well as all the kids that can run and play right. and don't have any physical handicaps that stop them. Well, thank you for that report, I appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Coley Bacicca. Keep forgetting me. <laughs> Um, thank you for all your work with this park. What I really like about this park, you mentioned that Bessemer School has an ADA playground. Yes, they do, but it's not accessible on the weekends. Um, the gates are locked. And so with your park, the kids can visit it seven days a week. So thank you. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tenso. Yeah, no, no matter how this works out, because I don't know that it fits under the ARPA uh, regulations, but we really do need to put that in. Uh, there's plenty of 
grants out there all over the place for this kind of uh, uh, recreational equipment. And there's no reason why we can't go out and find the money to do it. And I'll keep trying until I find it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Keith. All right, number four on the agenda, Pueblo's East Side Grocery, uh, Mr. Hardcop. Hello, um, my name's uh, Mike Hardcop, and thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight and to speak on this important matter. Um, about kind of about myself is, is I'm not a native to Pueblo. Um, I moved here as soon as I realized it existed, and um, through Google, and I lived up across from Mineral Palace Park for many years. And I would walk from my house, and I would go to Nick's Dairy Cream and get my ice cream, which started my love for the East Side. And then Eva Montoya stopped me one day and said, hey, I'm putting together a, uh, a garden on the east side and there's some spots for you. Do you want to do it? I'm like, sure, of course I do. And so I, I got two spots on the east side and I would drive over there or, or ride my bike over there with my, my wife and my, my toddler and we'd tend the garden and I just fell in love with the community. And in 2016, uh, the Safeway closed on the east side and suddenly there's a whole district with like 10 to 12,000 people with, without the ability to get a, a tomato, you know, something basic or a, a head of lettuce. Um, on the east side, 7-Eleven uh, is considered a grocery store, which is a travesty. Um, a family dollar, there's family dollar stores, but there's, there's nowhere to actually get food. And um, I've run restaurants, and so access to food to me has never been an issue. Um, but when you're when you're over there, as I tend to be a lot, you realize how hard it is to run out to go to the grocery store to get something for my mixed dairy cream. And so, what I've been trying to do for years is to try to figure out how to answer the the question or the problem has always been there's no grocery stores, and I've watched as the city of Pueblo has begged and pleaded and spent money to try to get um, large corporate cha chains to come to Pueblo. Um, we've invited Whole Foods, we've invited Sprouts, we've tried to get Safeway, King Supers. I mean, every single grocery store known to man has come over to East Side and just said no. And I just don't accept no for an answer, which is why I'm still in business and I'm still growing. And so I priced out this grocery store Grocery stores are ex exceedingly expensive. It costs about $2,000 a foot to refrigerate a space in a grocery store. So if you look at the ARPA proposal, um, it's, we're, we're asking for $735,000. It's mostly for refrigeration and to bring um, these two buildings back to life. The first building we're trying to bring back to life uh, most recently was City Pond, but it's actually, it's really cool. It's a 1930s uh, Arapaho grocery store from back in the day when we had neighborhood grocery stores owned by locals. And that business ran for years and years and years until the Safeway moved across the street and put all the independents out of business. And then when the Safeway decided to close, it created a void. And so we have to go back to the basics of getting uh, a neighborhood grocery store. We've got to reboot the neighborhood because a grocery store is the foundation of a neighborhood. It's a community center. It's where people see each other uh, trying to get milk, trying to get eggs, trying to go plan their dinner. Um, they, people can walk uh, down the block to go get a pound of sugar. Um, and it's something that's just it's lacking. And the second building that I, I've got two buildings under contract right now is uh, Chicken and Pasta, which is another really cool building. Uh, it used to be called Chicken and Cone, which is another neighborhood landmark. It was a, uh, a it's a fried chicken and it was an ice cream landmark store for many, many years. A very, very cool place run by a very good family here in town. And um, COVID. I mean, the elephant has always been COVID and COVID killed um, chicken and pasta. And it's a fully functioning kitchen. 
And when you look at modern grocery stores, modern grocery stores have a kitchen element so they can produce uh, family size meals so that people can um, run in and get dinner for five, get dinner for 10. You can um, make fresh salads. You can make all sorts of um, goods, ready to eat goods um, from scratch. And so where do we get the produce from? Well, Pueblo is a agricultural city. We forget that. And I think, I think we've forgotten that Pueblo grows things. And the Pueblo Food Project here in town has just been amazing trying to connect the dots. And so I've been working with them to find uh, a list of vendors and a list of, of um, produce vendors in this, in this region. And, and I've met with farmers. And I, I firmly believe that in the summer months when produce is in, in session, uh, coming ripe, that we'll be able to have the vast majority of all produce in this grocery store will be from Pueblo County. Um, we have a food service provider um, out of Kansas City, which is, a, which is a larger food service provider, so we can get value, um, pro value items throughout the year. So we can get name brands like Kraft, or we can get like Western Family, or we can get IGA, um, so that the families in the neighborhood will be able to afford the food. Um, the grocery store is, is going to accept SNAP. It's going to accept Double Up Food Bucks. Um, it's going to accept WIC. So the people that are most affected by um, downturns like COVID will be able to afford food. And they won't have to catch a cab or an Uber to go to King Supers or uh, your Safeway or Albertsons. They may actually be able to walk or ride a bike and get to the grocery store. Um, over half of it, there's population segments. 50% um, of the population is those that are kind of on the up and up. They're trying to, they're trying to get out of poverty and they're, they're just trying to make it. 20% of this group has no car. And so if you've got no car and you're struggling, then you go in and you get you know, fast food. You don't, you don't have access to food. And so what I'm trying to do is connect the dots and I've been listening to what the community needs and I've, I've been able to find a way to make it uh, not exceedingly profitable, but it's, it will be self-sufficient as a grocery store. And with the advent of the, the restaurant next door, the food, food kitchens will be able to offset all the costs. Um, questions are why would this work for me and it wouldn't work for a national chain is because I already have a job and I'm already working and I, I don't really need to make any money on this. This is not something that is, is for me. It's for the community at large and it will, it'll help secure my own food for my restaurants and other local vendors because, um, we spend three days a week at Solar Roast and it nicks shopping for things. And the food has been in and out. You can't get everything all the time. And so we've been having to send supply runners to Colorado Springs to get food to run my restaurants. And what I'm doing is creating my own, like my own supply chain. I'm creating my own food warehouse that's open to the east side and open to the city at large. And so this is so that I can secure my food for my business and for the, the people that are in my neighborhood to look after them. Um, the other part of the funding, so I'm, I'm asking for significant funds through you. I'm also taking out a, it's a personal uh, loan guarantee through the Colorado Fresh Food Fund. And so it's, it's my name on it. Um, and we're asking for $865,000 through that. I've gone through the first series of, um, of questions and interviews, and it goes to a loan committee in, um, I guess, it's week after next. Um, so the total project is $1.6 million, and we're going to bring back two vacant buildings on the east side. And hopefully we'll see you there getting some milk and eggs, you know. I'm sure <clears> thank funny. you. Uh, questions, comments? Anybody? Uh, Councillor Tensio? Yeah. Uh, throughout this whole process, I've been talking about the American Rescue Plan, and that's exactly what it sounds like. But I, I think this project fits 
And I questioned it in the beginning. Why would we put rescue money into a grocery store? But the food desert and the people in it have been exacerbated by COVID. And it's even worse today than it was prior to COVID. So you going in and providing a grocery store, I think is, is uh, you know, I've, I've been trying to rationalize it. And I think I've, I have because, uh, like I said, it's been exacerbated. The, the pandemic has made it even worse. Uh, people can't get out. And if they do get out, they can't go very far. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a real mess there. So I, I really congratulate you for doing this, first of all. And I, I hope the whole project works out. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Councilor Flores. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, what a great idea uh, was my first thought. But uh, uh, will the grocery store, uh, most grocery store have more than just food? You know, people need sundries and they need soap and they need, uh, your, is your intent to also include what a normal grocery store has or is it just food? Yeah, it'll, it's based on like an IGA concept. And so uh, I grew up in a tiny town in, in Roger, Rogers City, Michigan, and we had like three IGAs. And I live two blocks from one. It has a little bit of everything, um, you know. And so this is this is that style of grocery store. Um, there'll be, um, there, you know, like household items. Um, there'll be uh, like toiletries. There's going to be uh, meats. Um, have but it's a little bit of everything. Um, is the main thing it's supposed to it's a service to the community so people can get in there and purchase all the items the day-to-day -day items that they need um you know batteries screwdrivers that sort of thing nothing too extreme because i'm not an ace hardware but you know sure yeah my my main sections are the so the biggest department is the green grocery fresh fruits and veggies uh, meats, uh, local and Colorado meats, there's freezer foods, um, uh, dry goods with um, canned products, household products, um, dairy and cheese, we're working with Springside cheese. Um, it's like the main the main sections. Um, so pretty, pretty standard. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Councilor <laughs> McCulley Bachicha. Thank you for your work. I think this is a great idea. You know, the east side has been in quite a food desert for a while and um, they deserve to have fresh produce and not have to go to dollar stores to have processed foods. And it's just going to help on so much of a bigger picture and just our health in general. And, and I think we all deserve um, a good shot at good health. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Brown. Yeah, uh, it's, a, well, it's a great idea. I, I used to, when I worked on the east side, I used to shop there. And um, so I don't quite understand how come it, um, well, I guess I do. I do know why <laughs> it went down, but cor corporate like to make the most money they can. So they chose to close it. So thank you for your effort. Yeah. Council Winner. So the 750 is for refrigeration. Yep, yeah, there's um, not all refrigeration. I've got a list here. Um, so it includes, it includes inventories. So that um, refrigeration island refrigerators, 31,000, refrigerated grocery walls, 45,000, freezers, 60,000, um, glass front refrigerators. Like if you're at a King Supers, you open those up. Those are at 67,000. Um, open air coolers are like the reach in low boys, um, 11,000. Meat refrigeration, which is a different style of refrigeration, mm -hmm. is 30,000. Uh, walk in coolers is 17,000. Um, gondola shelving to hold the food is uh, about 40,000. Um, check stands that are COVID compliant are uh, 20,000. Um, it also includes um, the same thing everyone's talking about is uh, employee set up expenses and payroll to bring people on board. Um, Got to train them. Um, inventory, which is um, 140,000. And then um, a like a refrigerated delivery vehicle. So there's an ability to uh, move food around. If, if there's another store that needs food, we can, we can be transferring food. Um, and then just... Um, uh, the wholesale account setup fees is twenty five thousand. Um, just exterior work, and 
it adds up quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Kugosi, could you explain how this qualifies for ARPA? ARPA um, has a section that refers to startup businesses in qualified census tracts. So in that sense, uh, it, um, it qualifies. Um, but that's, that's just a preliminary analysis. Uh, I think what the mayor and chief of staff are asking is for direction from city council. Is this something you want us to work on? And then if it is, uh, I will research it more and then give you a final opinion. But I, I can't reject it out of hand. Um, so it's really direction from council. This is unusual, but uh, it, it may qualify under ARPA. That was that was really short. Thank you. I, I will try and keep it short. <laughs> so my very first job was at Nick's. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, it was Dairy Queen back then. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add, and uh, to, I don't know why, I just feel like the public should know, but Chicken and Pasta um, had the contract um, to service lunch for, for all of those vaccine clinics. And they were there every single day at every single vaccine clinic for lunch. And I was out there as an RN and I got 550 a day. So I can't imagine what he was getting paid. Oh, and just, I guess I, what I forgot was that, that Bo or, that's Bo Ortiz's restaurant. I guess that's the, the biggest thing that I wanted to put out there. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Great, thank you. We need to give him some direction. I think we're gonna do that at the end of the presentations. Uh, number five on the agenda is the Epic Pueblo presentation. So we'll pass on Epic Pueblo and we'll move on to bridging the mental health gap. And uh, Ms. Martinez? Yes. It's great to see you. Thank you. I'm gonna take my mask off so you can see all of me. Um, First, thank you for inviting me today. I have two proposals to put in front of you. And um, if you would guide me on, would you like me to present one at a time and then questions, or can I just present both of them to you? Just roll through both of them. Okay. Well, before I officially start, and this is official, I, I just want to make sure that you all know what we do at the Child Advocacy Center. We coordinate the investigation of child abuse. And I'm not going to convince you tonight that child abuse happens. I just want to make sure without a lot of graphic detail that you know the kind of abuse that we're talking about is, is severe criminal abuse in beatings, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, witness to a crime, trafficking, internet and porn crimes, things like that. So um, not to minimize all the other kinds of abuse that happened with children, I want to make sure that you know we're talking about very severe abuse because that affects um, a mental health of a child. And so um, their trauma when they're abused happens just like all other people at various times. Sometimes we as humans experience trauma right when an event happens, sometimes it's later. Sometimes it's segmented, but the reality is when a child comes to disclose what's happened to him or her, that usually by and large is the time that they're experiencing trauma. Um, may, may, maybe not exclusively the only time, but at least at that time. 
in the last two years, since March of uh, 2020, year and a half, um, Safer at Home was not safer at home for a lot of children who were trapped inside a home with somebody that was touching them like no child should be touched or um, witnessing things that children shouldn't see that should because they shouldn't happen. And other things have exacerbated the mental health landscape for children, like being isolated and things like that. Well, one of the side effects of that has been that um, we're in a state of emergency as defined by the Children's Hospital of Colorado for pediatric mental health, especially. We have um, a number of children who are already experiencing trauma because of COVID in their home environment, um, the parents have lost work, things like that, but then they get um, traumatized in another way. And um, our incidence of child abuse has gone up almost 30%. That's, that's dramatic. You know, we were experiencing about 210 children a year. And um, to increase that, you, every single day in Pueblo County, a child is being severely abused. And when they come to us, they are in crisis when they tell their story. The state of emergency really means that children are on a waiting list for sometimes six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks to get to see a mental health provider, especially one that has a pediatric specialty. And that's too long, frankly. That's, kids are in crisis then. And um, it's the kind of crisis where if they don't get treatment, sometimes even when they do get treatment, they're self-medicating, they're cutting, they're attempting suicide, um, and their mental health is just deteriorating even further. So I believe in, in my cohorts at the um, Pueblo Child Advocacy Center, believe that everybody in the industry of mental health right now is trying to solve this crisis. So we want to build a bridge and um, we've, We've speculated that 30 months is really going to be the time frame where we need to get kids into a mental health provider or for mental health care much sooner than that waiting period. So we would like to hire an on-site mental health provider. And that provider will specialize in pediatrics, but won't be exclusively for the children because sometimes their caregivers, non-offending caregivers, are also in a state of crisis. They're navigating something that didn't come in the playbook of raising children. Um, and they're navigating a new system with resources that they're unfamiliar with. And um, you know, sometimes it's feeling of guilt and anger, rage and things like that. So even though we hire somebody with a pediatric specialty, that won't be exclusively their charge. Um, this person will be a contractor and bring with him or her their own license so that they don't need supervised by somebody in our office. They're already fully competent and they'll also have their own professional liability. So um, we'd like to hire a contractor who brings with him or her the skill sets that we need. And um, one of the most fantastic things, first of all, it will be at no charge, nothing, no service at the Child Advocacy Center is um, costs families or children money. But the other thing that's really extraordinary that's in our plan is that their service can be on weekends and evenings as well. Um, I just heard earlier today, and I know it was at your statement that you were uh, kind of repeating the, I think the vaccine clinic, they're open all day, every day from eight to five which is really not all day for families who will lose their job potentially for, for taking off work to accompany a child to 
mental health care. Um, you know, there's a line of people behind them sometimes ready to take their job. And um, so we're going to have services that are available during the daytime, during the evening. We already have services on a crisis um, demand piece. So if somebody needs uh, two o'clock a.m., then we're going to be there. So um, I have some more to say about that, but before I go on, I want to shift from mental health care, that's the bridging the gap piece, to the physical care, because the other thing that we've noticed is many children have not gotten the medical care that they need for a variety of reasons because of COVID. Um, some of it has just been access to their doctor. Um, you know, when you're sick during a pandemic, even if you don't have COVID, it's still difficult to get medical health care. And um, the other thing is the nature of abuse tells us that siblings of children who are abused, who are there for a case, can really benefit also from a head to toe medical exam. So we have a lovely medical exam room in our building. It has beautiful murals on the side. Um, we have just upgraded a couple pieces. The um, exam that they do is non-invasive. And children usually say at the end that it was a positive experience for them because they learn more about their bodies. They learn about how things work in their bodies. Um, while the forensic medical examiner, or what we call a SANE, a sexual assault nurse examiner, um, looks for some evidence and collects evidence of abuse. So we'd like to extend that medical exam just to head to toe for siblings or other children that live in the same household and also for their siblings who without any presumptive um, evidence of, of trauma can just get a medical exam. And, and they can look for signs of abuse, but also the, the medical examiner can look for other things too that may have gone unnoticed for the last year or 18 months, sometimes even longer. And there will be no cost to that. It does not matter what their payer source is for regular medical care. Um, we're not billing out Medicaid, private insurers, there's no self pay, there's no co payment. And again, those services can be available in the evenings and on weekends. Those things can go hand in hand. So when a child comes in for an interview, we can schedule medical exams on the same day, but it can also be a different day because maybe a child involved in a case wants to come and just do the interview and have a medical exam on the next day. Um, we do have a really good program or referral process with um, forensic medical examiners and other medical professionals who are ready to provide this exam for other children. And the other thing that we can guarantee is if they don't have a primary care physician for whatever reason, and during the exam, they find something that needs further attention, we can get them into a, a practice. Um, it, and it won't matter what their payer source is either. So um, I want to add about both of these proposals for mental health care and for the physical health care that Pueblo Child Advocacy Center did um, submit those proposals both to the city and to the county. We also um, asked for funding from CSAC, but that CSAC portion of funding is non-duplicative. Um, and so I would ask, as you consider all of the pieces in play here, CSAC, the city fund, the county fund, that, that you, it balances out so we get full funding. The other funder that already has skin in the game with us is um, Caring for Colorado. They had a special impact fund that was really focused on mental health care for youth. And we received fund, uh, notice after we submitted our ARPA request that we did get that funding. That was non-duplicative. We were counting on it. So I just want to be clear that we've been thoughtful about the 
number of dollars we're asking from each of the players. And the, the duplicative piece is ARPA city and county. So I hope that that works out as you weigh our request. Um, the um, ARPA commitment, I would also say for the meta, mental health care, is that we would not need the money in our bank account right away because we've got the Caring for Colorado um, funds, but we would need the commitment because, um, you know, just to speculate for a minute, and I think that you'll all agree, we can't hire somebody as a contractor for just one year. Ask them possibly to relocate, um, and I'm, I'm going to explain that in a minute, but then to stay only for the amount of funding we have for a short year. And then, you know, that's, that's really very soft money in, you know, as we call it. Um, we would like to hire somebody locally. That's always our preference, right? Keep, keep people here and employed, but we don't want to limit ourselves because what we know about the state of emergency is there is a shortage of mental health providers. And it's possible that we'll have to hire somebody from outside of Pueblo. Um, the kinds of things that the mental health provider would do is crisis intervention, um, above and beyond the normal crisis that they're in, trauma screening, counseling, in-services. And um, I just cannot stress enough the value of having somebody on site to do mental health care and serving more children um, who haven't had care because of COVID um, is just cannot be understated in terms of serving our children. So I am open for whatever questions that you can put at me. Thank you. <clears throat> questions, comments? Uh, Mayor? Hi. Hi. The, uh, did I understand you correctly that your request to the county is duplicative of yes. your request it's to the city? The exact same proposal was submitted. Um, I can say I've not heard a word about it. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the money that we requested from CSAC is not duplicative. Okay. I heard that as well. Thank okay. you. Councilor Flores. You know, uh, in the back of my mind, I've been wanting to. Uh, I think I've talked to Laura about this, about bringing um, all of the agencies, um, including law enforcement, and, and letting the city see that there's a child abuse problem. And it's obviously even worse than probably I was thinking. But uh, I think that that's something that um, uh, I think needs to be, the story needs to be told, I think people just don't want to hear about it, but it's, it's happening. Uh, if you were to find the right doctor or psychiatrist uh, and medical professional, uh, what kind of a commitment would you have to give? Uh, is it three years, five years? Uh, it sounds to me uh, like you need a commitment much longer than a year. We want a commitment for 30 months. And that has been purely speculative based on a a compendium of information from uh, Children's Health Colorado. Um, I do want to be clear, though, that it is not our intention to hire a psychiatrist. We want to hire uh, all, either an LCSW or um, even a, uh, I'm trying to think of the acronym, LPC. Um, that's the guidance that we received from a psychiatrist and also a professional um, psychotherapist um, who's in private practice. We uh, frankly do not, we didn't know very much about hiring a mental health professional. That's not in our wheelhouse. So we've done our homework to find out what we need to hire to provide the kinds of services that we want. And so that 30 month commitment to a contractor includes a relocation fund if they need to relocate, but also a stay on bonus at the end, because um, 
first of all, continuity for children is important. I don't expect that because it's a bridge to regular care, that it would have to be the same person um, for all 30 months, but that would really be beneficial. Uh, we want them to be trained in forensic interviewing. There's a, a very specific skill that goes with not leading a child into answers. It has to really have legs to stand up in court. And so if we're going to provide training from our side, we want somebody to stay for 30 months. So we've worked in a $5,000 stay on bonus for completing all 30 months with us. So what you've done is assuming the county contributes their portion and our portion, your numbers really take into consideration a 30 month period. Yes. Okay. That, just to clarify. Thank you. Yes. I would add to, if I may, that during those 30 months, starting immediately, we're going to do outcomes measurements so that we know, or one way or the other, is this helping, are we meeting goals, and so on, so that if 30 months as a speculative number is not long enough, and there still is a mental health crisis, that we have the leverage to ask for more funds from other funders to extend that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, SRDA. Twenty time council president, Mr. Naraki. Like uh, old home week. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, President Atencio. Good evening, Mayor Garishar, Counselor, Madam Clerk, Council, and Chief of Staff, and Daryl. I want to introduce George Shintala. He's one of my colleagues. He's been at SRDA for almost 20 years. We have very little turnover, even though we don't pay nothing. It's a great work environment and a great facility that the city owns that we work in. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come here tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about the project, and, and George has a little bit more information that he'll share with you. But uh, we contracted with uh, a couple of individuals, a former recreation instructor at the university, Jay Zar and his wife Cleo Zar. They have been providing outdoor recreation experiences for the last six months, uh, kayaking at the lake, trips up the mountain park. For any of you that are 50 or older, in case I'm not sure everybody up there is over 50, but uh, uh, they're going to be doing a hike up the Bartlett Trail to the top of Greenhorn uh, within the next week or two. Uh, I've been on horseback and it was hard on horseback. I can't imagine what it's going to be like walking up there. So. It's really been important through the pandemic to be able to create other types of venues for recreation for the senior population, uh, to be able to keep them active and get out of their houses and be able to socialize. The Senior Center for All Practical Purposes has been closed down this past year uh, for anything but appointments only, and a few small groups have been able to meet there uh, on a regular basis. But as far as having an open door policy and being able just to come and socialize and take classes. All those things have been deterred to the parks department where we've hired staff to provide Tai Chi and yoga and those kind of outdoor experience things for the summer. So what we're looking at doing is building a structure. And I want to tell you that we have put a proposal to the county for the exact amount of money, but this was done it's been a number of months now since we did these proposals. Since that time, we've secured $70,000 from the state and $125,000 from the LeBert Cloak Foundation uh, for this project. Uh, it's going to be, by the way, it's going to be called the LeBert Cloak Pavilion. Can you believe that? $125,000 worth. And uh, so we're excited by the fact that this project though is incredible because you can't believe how expensive anything is to build. All the groundwork that has to be done in between the senior center and the Union Plaza apartments, 
that this structure will be built on Union Plaza property. So it will not be on the senior side, but we hope to be able to tie the two together because there's a walkway that separates on the property line that we'd like to be able to put a shade structure over that walkway where there can be a patio where people can walk outside of the, uh, and socialize outside of the senior center. Since we closed in that balcony and made that into activity area for inside, we have no outdoor space uh, in the senior center. But a structure will be built. It's estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of $250,000 to prepare that ground and create an outdoor space, a green area for doing yoga and Tai Chi outside in the summertime and the fall time. And then having a pavilion, which will have ceiling heaters, uh, we'll have fans for the summertime, and we'll have storage space. So for all practical purposes, uh, the majority of the money has already been raised through the state and the private foundation. So the, the money we're asking for tonight and also the duplicate money we asked for for the county at the time didn't know that we were going to be able to secure all this other funding, that we will only access it if we need it. And we will we would love to see the, the city and the county be able to share in that cost since we gave the same proposal to each entity. Um, so that so you kind of have an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, George can add a little bit more to it, but we will have an agreement between the city and uh, SRDA owns Union Plaza and Richmond Apartments. Uh, there are two single purpose corporations. Those are HUD 202 projects that we received funding for back in 93 and 95. Uh, those properties are to be used for senior housing, subsidized senior housing for 40 years. Uh, that expires, the first one, Union Plaza expires sometime around 2035 and Richmond about 2037. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we contract with the housing authority to take care of the property. They would maintain this facility also, but an agreement would be between the city and SRDA to be able to make sure that seniors in the community coming to the senior center, which is a city facility, will be able to access that facility there. And that'll be an ongoing agreement. We can do it for 10 years at a time or however the city wants to do it. Um, George, would you like to add? Well, like I said, I've been with SRDA for going on 20 years. Uh, I've noticed you know, senior population, they thrive on socialization. They need it. When we go out to deliver meals, they, they, they want to talk to you for hours. You can't do that. You have to give them their meal and move on. When they come to the Senior Resource Center for us to play pool, games, just to watch TV, put puzzles together, uh, they're there because they need that one-on-one -on -one talking with people and stuff. Uh, since the pandemic, we haven't been really able to do that. We've had many people asking, when are you going to open up the facilities again? Because they're, they're, they're dying to come in and, and talk to people and, and have this, uh, that kind of relationship that they, they just need to have. Um, we're proposing this uh, uh, pavilion, and it sounds like a lot of money, but like Mr. Naraki says, when you go out and you start asking, what do you need to do to do this? Um, the planning department steps in and says, well, you have to have this. And you think that you would make it out of metal, uh, but found out that metal is not a one hour burning thing. So it has to be wood. Uh, then there's the electric, electrical. You just can't put electrical in there because then there's all the other kind of stuff that you have to do. They want you to tie it in so that it looks kind of like the regular buildings that are between it and everything. So the cost just like mounts and mounts and mounts. But for being able to have the people come into SRDA, some of them still are afraid um, uh, of catching COVID and stuff. But they would love the idea that if you had something outside that they can go out, have fresh air, and then they're not uh, competing against everybody trying to get the air in the building. Um, so 
With that being said, we, uh, uh, we've got a committee. Um, our Vince Guerrero is our uh, board chair. Uh, his brother, Mark Guerrero, he's uh, USCP's uh, architect and uh, building supervisor for all the buildings out there at USC uh, Pueblo. Uh, Luis uh, Nazario, he's a, a, a contractor with Houston. Jim Munch, who was a, a city employee with the planning department, the HARP project, and, uh, along with our SRDA building when we were doing that. And then Bill Swick with the, working on some uh, uh, innovative landscaping stuff ideas. And along with that, that's what we're coming with our project to, to make this come to finalization. So um, I think it's going to be a really nice project. The people are going to be dying to get in there. Or maybe I should say that. <laughs> wrong word. Wrong word. Wrong word. Wrong word. <laughs> they're, they're waiting to get there so they can have that socialization. And uh, we're going to keep them alive. That's right. We're, basically, we're going to keep them alive with that socialization. And uh, uh, we just thank you for even you know considering our proposals and uh, what we can do for the seniors. Thank you, thank you. And it's, it's, it's very encouraging to know that when I turn 50, there'll be some place for me to go and have some activities. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, don't check IDs. <laughs> Is uh, any questions, comments? Uh, Mayor. Steve, how much have you raised? 200,000, is that or more than that? Uh, 125 from Robert Hogue and 70,000 from the state department. 195. 195, right. And, and of course, we would work with uh, Andrew Hayes, the public works director, in terms of how that money would be utilized for the city's park. So, do you already have it designed? Have you picked out? We just had this conversation about who's going to design it, who's yeah, going to hire we, the contractor. Are you guys going to handle that, or what's. We've had uh, Mark Ferrer from. Uh, George referred to he's the architect for the university. And uh, we've also had Bill Swick, that who's a landscape architect besides retired from the planning department, that they've been the ones that have been kind of guiding us and they could now we're gonna put out the bid. And Louis Nazario is helping us with that since he's the finance person for Houston Construction. And so uh, I mean it's gonna be a fancy looking pole barn. I mean, and I just can't believe how much it costs to do these things. I was just kind of taken back. When we enclosed that balcony, we raised two hundred thirty thousand dollars just to enclose that balcony on the uh, south side of the building. So um, I guess it shouldn't shock me, but we have to have a facade with this pavilion that will tie into both the senior center and uh, and Union Plaza. Okay, thank you. Thank. You. Uh, Councillor Flores, I just have one good question. You know, the uh, uh, urban renewal uh, and the city are going to be putting in that uh, all those statues and stuff between the parking garage and right. Union Plaza. Uh -huh. uh, is that near there? Am I in the wrong spot? What will the back part of it? No, we're, we're talking between, we're talking about the north east side of the senior center mm -hmm. and the south east side of Union Plaza apartment. There's a, a space you drive by, there's a grass area, and then there's a big concrete patio that goes to the back. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. This is gonna be a 16 by 45 foot pavilion. And then there'll be a grassy area to be able to do outdoor type like yoga. And, and I just thought eating. maybe there was a connection or an opening that, you know, people could look at all of those beautiful, uh, the landscape, oh. all the artwork yeah. along with, uh, but I guess unfortunately I'm on the wrong side. all there is is parking yeah. and, and street on that side. Of the right. I was on the wrong side. And then when they expanded the, for the senior center, when they expanded the Ellen Hamill drive, yeah. they took quite a few feet off of the parking lot. So there's really no place on the south side of the senior center to do really okay. an effective outdoor sure. area. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you Appreciate guys it. to be here. Okay, so we know we know that moving forward that the, uh, the ADA playground will not be on the agenda because we're going to move, we have to find money different place for that. 
<clears throat> so the Pueblo's Eastside Grocery, everybody good with moving that forward? Yes. The Eastside Grocery. And so what we're approving is for for staff to look into that further, correct? Well, that's not what uh, Mr. Gagosik said just a minute ago. Okay, the um, unfortunately, um, Laura's Park is not in a qualified census tract. Therefore, we cannot use ARPA money for that. Right. We Tonight, we're just talking ARPA. Okay, so that will not be on the agenda. No, we know that. What okay. we're talking about is the East Side Grocery. East Side Grocery, you're going to, it will not be on next Monday's agenda. It, it, uh, hopefully, I can put a package together uh, that qualifies uh, if you want me to do that. So that's the question, if we want, we want to do yeah. that. You know, I support the, I support this wholeheartedly, but I want to make a, a determination here because of the conversations we had at a previous ARPA meeting, where several salespeople were, or, or a couple of sales pe salespeople. I think I'm still at work. No, they're all salespeople. Everybody <laughs> right. here, I said, here you. those damn yeah. salespeople. Uh, <laughs> a couple of counselors were when we were talking about uh, the. Neighbor Works project and the Dolores Ware to Jack Bay project uh, weren't for that because uh, the Jack Bay project was a for profit project. Well, the Eastside Grocery is a for profit project. So it's okay for, for these same counselors to say that that's okay, but the, but the 300 homes on the West Side doesn't have the impact that an East Side Grocery has. Well, I, you yeah, know, no, the, I'm talking to the no, counselors I'm, I'm, and just making here to argue uh, about the East Side Grocery. I think, at least on its face, it might qualify. That's all I can say. It's it's a lot you, of money. We're but you talking. get what the point I'm making. Though. The uh, point got, I'm making is we that take your point. Yeah. That that the the project on the west side is just as important as this as this, and just because it's a for profit uh, endeavor doesn't shouldn't disqualify it from being considered. That's all I'm saying. So you've got direction. Everybody wants to move forward with this. Well, uh epic pueblo we're not going to do anything on no, let me let me just outline that for you i assume everybody knows what the epic program is that it's set up by businessmen that they provided books to uh, uh to children throughout the years and have had reading programs with children if you look at that what they're asking for is uh i think thirty six thousand dollars over a two-year period eighteen thousand dollars a year that they would use to buy books and um uh, educational supporting materials. Uh, I think most of this goes to low income individuals uh, prop, um, and they supplement these monies the with uh, private individual donor contributions. You know, I, I think we can probably move forward on that without um, them being here. It becomes highly recommended. The United Way is their fiscal agent for their activities. So they partnered with uh, the library district in the city and county on the summer reading program because of their relationship there. So. Yeah, well, the uh, reading and uh, books and, and have been exacerbated. Uh, you know, kids haven't been able to go to the library throughout the whole year and, and they haven't been. Able, so this qualifies. And that, that, that's been my point all along. Like, uh, I hate to argue with Mark, but the Jack Bay thing doesn't. They, they, it hasn't been hurt by by uh, COVID because it, it wasn't on the books to begin with. Whereas people on the east side have been hurt by COVID and you know, able to get groceries. Yeah. That's just my point. That's well, you could so argue I, that people haven't had been able to get houses housing because of COVID too. I, I just have a question. So. Um, it, it was my understanding that these 
these um, applications were presented to council were, were already um, vetted by you as qualifying for ARPRA. But actually that's not the case because of uh, the, no, the internet when, thing that was the, the 5G yeah, no, presentation that was way off. No. Um, so I, as, I guess the, um, when, the ADA when part When I present call it, an uh -huh. ordinance or a resolution, it's been vetted. Okay. This is before then. So this is just informative. It's informative. Um, I, I agree with the mayor that EPIC uh, qualifies. Uh, the two PCAC qualify. Uh, SRDA qualifies. Sure. So the ones that don't or the ones that the east side grocery may qualify okay. but we're going to need more information sure. so if you want me to proceed with epic both pcac and the srda i can have those on the agenda next monday but only if you say you're going to vote for them i mean <laughs> i'm good yeah i'm good too. Yeah. i think you have support are there any questions? Any other comments? Well, uh, Councilor Brown, are you going to be looking into the uh, East Side Grocery Prospect as far as it's legal? Because <clears throat> having worked on the East Side, finding a grocery store finding is hard to do on the East Side. Well, well, we, it, it's a need. I mean, everything you've heard is a need. The question is, when we're audited, uh, as we probably will be five years from now, uh, does it meet the regs? Councilor Winter? So this is off subject with ARPA, but um, I would like to look into contracting some with some kind of company for graffiti removal. Um, you're looking at me like that for but we don't we we can't keep up with it at all and and the city actually doesn't have a great job well maybe maybe we need to look into that but uh, um i was told that the uh, parks department can't keep up with it well that would be a good reason Okay, so code enforcement, do they have their own equipment to take care of it? I'm trying to remember now whether uh, the last time I talked to them, it might have been inoperative or needed repairs, but they have their own equipment. Yes, they do. Okay. When I was a private citizen, I'd call them all the time to bring that out when somebody graffitied brick and they... That's the best way to get it off brick. They just blast it off there and you can't even tell it's been there. And they, you know, sometimes you had to wait two or three days, but. Uh, okay, it was, was it was my understanding that we were sharing this machine with, with, with the harp. With the harp? Yeah. No? I'm sure they use it on the harp or we do graffiti removal for the harp if they ask us to. Okay. But as far as, you know, sharing a machine, I don't, it's, I, I would think we're the ones that do that. Okay, I guess I need to find out more. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I do. We're oh, one more. Oh. This is very short. I just wanted to confirm Councillor Winner's um, uh, response or question or comment with respect to the process to, uh, for these ARPA um, requests to come before City Council. And you are correct. They were intended to be um, vetted already by the committee and then the internal committee and the mayor's recommendation. We just didn't catch uh, the ADA playground last Wednesday when the city attorney notified us that it was not in the census track. We, ne we found that on Thursday. And by that time, they'd been notified uh, that they should come to plan to present and the playground, which were, the mayor said was so important enough that we left it on the agenda for presentation. But otherwise, that is the intent and process. 
So how did how did the 5G program end up in front of us? Uh, the, the, they presented also to the mayor with the, 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 I think that was the SCED program that you're speaking about. They presented to the mayor and we had heard, this is the anecdotal hearing, that the county had already, but that came from the presenter, had already agreed and that they were on a, on a, on a fast track. Well, when we came to find out, um, it was all timing again when the mayor said, well, we should probably get this, at least the presentation in front of city council before you know we're going to be the city slowing down the process well all of that came to a very different pathway after we actually saw the presentation let me follow up on sked um the county um i believe will award arpa money to sked um i don't agree with that decision because of the regs that I have, but they're going to give one and a half percent of their ARPA money to SCED. Uh, SCED is going to use those funds for SCED salaries, overhead, hire uh, a broadband consultant. I don't think that qualifies under the SCED regs. I think the only thing that qualifies is actual infrastructure where we extend fiber. Um, so, but I, I want to close the loop and say uh, the county attorney has informed me that uh, the county is going to approve one and a half percent of their SCED. I'm sorry, of their ARPA funds for SCED. Can I just clarify one point for my notes? Um, so I have that the council was interested in moving forward with the research on the east side grocery store. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. 